Welcome to The Behavioral View. everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of The Behavioral View. My name is Shannon Hill. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Central Reach Institute and I'm here with friends today. Who am I here with? I am Dr. Carrie Millico. I'm the Director of Clinical Programming at Central Reach. Hi, I'm Nissa Van Etten. I'm the Director of Assessment and Clinical Training here at Central Reach. Hi, we ladies. Super- Hi, we're super excited to have our guest. Secret guest, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Camille Kolu. I'm with Cusp Emergence and Cusp Emergence University in Colorado. And we are so grateful to have you here today to talk about trauma-informed ABA. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for having me. So excited to meet all of you. This is going to be a good episode. I have um, put you on my wish list when we did the end of the year um, list of people that we think of as our dream guests. And we have really been doing a good job of actually roping those people to come (laughs) in and talk with us. So super excited about this one. But we like to kind of roll in gently before we dive in and talk about a question of the day, which you have nominated a good one, um, which is a book or article or resource from outside of behavior analysis that you think is good and useful for behavior analysts to read. Do you want to kick us off, Camille, or do you want to go last? You know what? I'm happy to kick it off because I did not choose anything behavior analytic. I thought it would be kind of fun to share what was on my bed night table. Yeah. Because, so I am a parent of toddlers right now. And I'm going around, as everyone knows, writing books with titles like, I'm so sorry. And to everyone I gave advice to before (laughs) I really got in the trenches. Um, Not that we can't be great behavior analysts in any situation, right? But I'm going to say these books about playful parenting. have been lifesavers for me in several ways. So number one, they have helped me sort of break down to RBTs. What is it like to play if you have no idea how? But Uh second, if you have a deep toddler, as I do, my four-year-old, wow, peaceful parent, happy kids, and playful parenting. Man, what do you do when your toddler wants to play the bad guy because of what she's reading? And how do you respond? And how do you break down all that tension? It has been really, really good for me to read this. Really good. <laughs> can you kind of can you tell me the authors of those so that I can make sure? And yeah. Share so I'll mention the first one that I read: um, "Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids." And mm-hmm. it sounds funny coming from a BCBAD, but I learned so much from how to stop yelling and start connecting. <laughs> and the thing is, she kept citing this other guy whose name is Lawrence Cohen. So <laughs> you may not have read every or appreciate everything about these authors. However, they have some really good strategies about connecting with folks through play and being playful. And so I, I've i really been benefiting from them. Camille, you are speaking my language, girl, because <laughs> let me tell you what's on my nightstand And I just happened to have it right next here. I was not really prepared for this conversation, but I like this. That is that. So we talked about books before and it was like the book that everyone needs to read. And that like puts a lot of pressure on me, but I like this. I like this reframing of the book on your nightstand. Dun, 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 dun. What Inside by Dr. Becky Kennedy. Yes! Uh, for listeners, this Camille just showed it that it's on her bookshelf as well. Have you have you read it or is this on your to-read book uh, list, Camille? So I have read it and I have been saying to my daughter, because she's in the throes of a difficult stage, mm-hmm. I've been saying things like, no matter what you do all day, you are so good inside. And she just relaxes and falls asleep. And I think, 
I needed that. I needed to tell myself that. <laughs> Two things can be true. Or I'm going to give you the most generous interpretation right now. Like <laughs> this book has been so great. Uh, I wish that I read this book earlier on in my parenting journey. Uh, I am thankful that I am reading this book now. My kids are 7, 9, and 11. Uh, and while she is not a behavior analyst, she <laughs> does not compete with our behavior analyst word, world view. Uh, but there are things where like she's – she has us go beyond behavior, right? Like it's saying like, okay, yes, behavior shows us more about like things that are going on, like how our children maybe are seeing the world and that we need to dig in and, and look at like, what are they feeling? And let's connect. Like it's, it's not about mm -hmm. just treating the behaviors, but let's look at that connection and building that connection. And one of the things that uh, I've been doing right now is uh, focusing on our parent training curriculum here at Central Reach. And uh it's, it's one of like my most meaningful projects that I've uh, had a chance to work on. And one of the things that we're, we're wanting to do is um, uh, making sure that parents aren't just like mini RBTs and that, but parents spend so much time being a teacher, being an advocate that we put it off on the back burner. And I'm like, you know, this going and, and reading Dr. Becky and like, I'm going to put those books that you just mentioned, Camille, on my list too, is because that like oftentimes as parents, when we're doing so many things, building that connection and respecting our role as a parent is often the last thing on our, on our list when it's one of the most sacred things that we need to preserve. So, uh, yeah, this has been just, uh, a wealth of information and uh, just for my own life, but also in building into the work that I'm doing. So while it, it is not a behavior analytic book, I feel like, and to your point, Shannon, it is something that behavior analysts should read because I think it is helpful in the work that we do in connecting with families. Well, you know, I, I always, love it. I, wrote it down. <laughs> I love it when people choose this type of question because I think it's so important for us to broaden our horizons. Nissa, what did you bring? So I don't have my book. It's down by my bedside table, but it's Atomic Habits by um, mm -hmm. James Clear. Mm -hmm. And it's really just, um, I like it as a reminder just to stay in kind of my goals and my habits and make sure that I'm following through. It, I'm very much a routine oriented person. So it does help that I stay within my routine. Whenever I step out of it, I feel out of whack. I feel like it even leads into my parenting and my patience and you know, Carrie, when you spoke about what you're working on yesterday, I, there's so many light bulbs that were going off. Like, yes, I need to be present. Yes, I need to remind myself that. And it needs to become a habit that I set. Um, so I, I do reflect on it, you know, as often as I can. Ethan's reading that one too. I hear it's a good one. It's a really good one. Yeah. Well, and I don't have a copy to show um, either. This is going way, 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 way back. But longtime listeners of our show, all three years, you have learned by now that my journey into behavior analysis has been wonky. So um, I have a master's degree that's actually in counseling. And um, I felt many times that that's been an advantage for some of the things that we struggle with in today's topic, even, you know, as behavior analysts trying to figure out how to, to work the human side of things into our work. And Carl Rogers is such an important person to read if you're in the counseling realm. Even if you don't consider yourself a person-centered therapist, which most people don't, they still teach Rogers work as a way of learning how to relate to other people. So he has a book from 1980, uh, kind of towards the end of, end of his career, where it's more philosophical, and it's called A Way of, the, a way of Being, mm -hmm. which is just talking mm -hmm. about his journey towards personhood and his philosophy of working with others. And I just love it. I just think it's fabulous and a useful tool. So I, 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 I love Carl Rogers. Love it. There's nothing not to love there. There's really <laughs> not. Um, and I also love for people who are listening to this right now and not watching that there is a sleeping cat on Bill's <laughs> chair. I know. I was just thinking, I was like, I wonder if Mojo, so my cat seems Mojo. Um, and during casual meetings, he often makes an appearance, but he's, 
he's a little too pre-Madonna to just let me do my thing. He would, um, he, he would just sit and, and press all the buttons on the, <laughs> on the desk. I don't know if he would just, he would just be okay not being center stage. Um, I hope that, I hope that our relationship allows us to, to get to the place where you and your cat are at. You know what, Carrie? This is only because he's so young and he naps. When he wakes up, he is wicked. And he almost submitted my article early, the wrong version of it earlier today. So I think that we're on the same page. We'll okay. see. Yeah. He may start biting my hair or the mic in a second or turn me purple. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, is, that, is, that is my cat too. Yes. <laughs> Well, we have a, a list of topics that we're going to try to weave into today's talk, but I kind of want to jump in, jump in hot, if that's okay. Um, recently, and well, not, not necessarily recently, there has been some talk among behavior analysts, especially in some, some other podcasts, about the, the use of not a, well. Sometimes it seems like they're they're attacking the language of trauma informed care, and sometimes it feels like they are attacking the the whole philosophy of it. I think it depends on which person is talking. And um, so, one of the things that has been brought up recently, I thought when I was listening to that podcast that you probably had some some suggestions because. When I say attack, I am also, I'm going to throw this out here. I am working on something in myself too. And I have failed in it in the last um, podcast that was in this topic. I did scream a little bit at the end. <laughs> I my, my, my inability to understand the other viewpoints. Mm. And so trying to listen with less emotion and I'm trying to hear things for the value, right? And so as I was listening to that, although some of it upset me, I I applied this resolution <laughs> to the listening of it. And just, I, I could hear that the people speaking didn't necessarily object to the ideas of, of working with people where they are, trying not to be punitive, trying to assess on an individual level, but they were, questioning whether anyone has done any work on how to behaviorally identify when a person is showing signs of trauma. And they said unequivocally, no one has. And I'm not sure that's true. So I wanted to kind of just start off with that, Camille. Mm -hmm. Do you have any answer to that? Has there been any work in that area? Well, so talk about jumping in hot, Shannon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to back up a second and ask for anybody listening, does behavior analysis care about fear? Okay. So think about rapport and everything that those approach-based therapies are based on for a second. The presumption is that you've got to be safe in order to approach a mm -hmm. stimulus. You do. Yeah. I mean, neurologically, that's true. Physically, that's true. There's so many reasons in terms of what your brain architecture is doing when you are freezing versus when you are moving toward a stimulus, right? And by the way, Meyer and Seligman have a really good review paper of learned helplessness 50 years later. If you want to do a dive back into some of that research on what is it like in, you know, for an organism trapped in fear. Um, but so think about the word fear for a second. What is contextual fear conditioning? What is that? Do we care about that? So most people are going to shake their heads and say, yeah, of course, that's extremely behavioral. Okay. When I look at a little boy or a little girl or an old lady or a mother and I see a fear response, I see the physiological indicators of fear. Right after I present a certain stimulus, like I say, hey, we're about to go visit dad. He's just out of prison. And the child urinates on the floor and starts to shake. Okay, I don't have to do a whole lot of research to understand that that child is 
in the middle of a fear response. Mm -hmm. And so necessarily even when that happens, you don't necessarily even happen have to know that dad just got out of prison or that anything has happened. Just that right there is enough to know. Right. And, you know, because of some of the separation in our field between how we talk about emotions, what we do with those kinds of things, there has been sort of a big black box we've put those things into, and we don't always talk about it. Of course, Fryman has given us great examples of why we should study emotion, but I just want to point out that our very field is predicated on that. You know, going back to the respondent side, there's it's amazing to combine the respondent side with the operant side. When I'm working with a person, if I address it all operantly, but there's still something I have not addressed in terms of those physiological responses, the the fear that's still there, you know, I still need to work on respondent extinction. And so that's why I still work on, on things that aren't carefully articulated in our literature just yet, because we have good precedent to do so. And so as long as we do a good job of describing what we see and how it relates to the environment, you know, it can work. So I know I'm, I'm sort of dancing around your question, Shannon, but I think it's very important to realize this is not new at all. We have been treating fear-related behavior for a really long time. And, you know, Camille, you say fear-related behavior and you know, all of this has been coined like trauma-informed care and this particular, and I, you know, this isn't about this particular podcast, but like the, I, I also listen to this and Shannon, you give more grace to, I think sometimes I like just to call a spade a spade, but like there was some things that were being said about like trauma and like the DSM is very clear about the what trauma is defined as and like trauma associated with PTSD. Like when we are, the practices that when we engage a, a behavior analyst, does it, I, I have, I'm like doing all these runways here. Um, is it, does it need to be defined as trauma? Does it need to be classified as trauma? Are we, is it, can we just call it fear responses? Are they ACEs? Does it even matter? Like, you know, the criticism is that like, you know, there's war vets and their behavior isn't even classified as trauma. Like, is, are we just kind of being critical of the term just to be critical? Or can we just say, hey, that these are a class of behaviors that are showing fear responses in the in the presence of aversive stimuli that are aversive to them. And whether we call it ACEs or trauma or whatever, that our approach to them is is going to be a bit different than if they look a little bit different. Like I mean, is it, is it, do we have to use a particular label that is like, okay, it has to be trauma or is trauma only really narrowly defined as the DSM does it? Or is there a wider definition for trauma? Does it have to be related to PTSD? Like this is not an area of specialization for me, trauma specifically. So before Would before you, anyone answers, let me do just a little bit of work. I have to say a secret word for our CEU seekers. The first one is informed. I N F O R M E D. Camille, go ahead. <laughs> sure. I so I think there are a lot of answers to that. I think first of all, I am not in the business of diagnosing. I'm not a psychiatrist. Sure. I'm not also a clinical psychologist. So I have my PhD is in behavioral neuroscience, and then I'm a BCBAD, right? Mm -hmm. So I will not ever treat or not treat based on a diagnosis, and I treat all across the spectrum, all diagnoses, all ages. However, if you want to, Carrie, I will share with you my working definition right now of trauma. Would you like that? Yeah, please. This is how I'm thinking about it. So from a behavioral perspective, trauma constitutes adverse experiences, including conditioning experiences with both operant and respondent components, 
And here's the kicker, because if all that was true and the person doesn't change their behavior, if you don't see related debilitating response classes, right, to mm -hmm. your point earlier, mm -hmm. then maybe we don't need to differentiate treatment. So here's the second part of that definition. With subsequent adverse behavioral and biological medical effects and long-term impacts. Mm. Okay. So it has to have both. It has to have both. It has to have both. So by definition, an experience that was related to something they would have called trauma in the literature, mm -hmm. by definition, there will be those long enduring impacts. And we know a lot about what what has changed medically and some of the great risk medically. Um, we know a lot about buffers against those things now. Um, but the point is, if they if if the experiences don't have that interaction with the person's repertoire and stream now, then what That's does it matter? And so I'm always going to take that functional contextual <laughs> approach. Yep. Is there, and I'm excited to have someone who, who has the neuroscience background as well here. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about a neurotype of autism that overlaps with the biological responding that a person would have if they have experienced trauma? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, so in one way, there are things that a person with autism might find aversive that someone else might not find aversive. And an example might be some kinds of social stimula, stimuli, right? And so there are certainly biological underpinnings of why those individual differences are there in those neurotypes. But that can certainly, you know, there, that can certainly relate in terms of when somebody is going through a difficult time with trauma, if they also have autism, then things might be harder. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain behaviors that you can look for that are present in samples of folks who have autism and have also said, I have been through significant physical abuse. Mm -hmm. And the brain has changed when we go through really aversive experiences. And the brain, of course, is different in autism. And some of that does right. overlap, but I don't think I have the wherewithal to explain that precisely right sure. now. And so when the autism community has told us, and there's been documented instances of this uh -huh. also in research, that they experience, like, there's different experiences, both biologically, right, uh, with respect to, like, different stimuli, audibly, visually, textually, that can react, you know, that could um, be more aversive. And then socially um, have experienced his, his, throughout their history um, more aversive contexts than their holistic peers. Then going into a therapeutic setting with the assumption of, hey, it's probably likely that you have experienced uh a trauma, a traumatic event is, is pretty safe. Whereas, um, someone, I, I had heard someone mention that for clinical psychologists to assume that whoever they're working with has experienced a traumatic event, that's not something that people do. But when you are working with a population where the stakes are against them if such as you're working with war vets and you're like hey i'm going i'm going to proceed gently because you know the likelihood of you experiencing traumatic event is probably high when we're working with um you know a very marginalized demographic we're proceeding gently because we're assuming that the likelihood of them experiencing trauma in their past is probably high, then that's probably safer than it is for us to assume that, hey, you're just like me. I I had a great childhood. I experienced sensations in this way. So therefore, I'm, I'm going to go hard at you. I think you can take it because I can take it. 
Or even if I didn't have a great childhood, even if I come from the perspective of I took some some knocks mm. growing mm. up and, and I'm not trying to I'm tougher for it, I'm stronger for it, I right rose above it. So because I rose above it, you can too. My my dad smacked me around and yours didn't, so therefore you haven't been traumatized. Yeah. Um sorry, I didn't want to take that away, but I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, so I think that's important, right? And I'm going to go back to your your word that you used, Carrie, about assuming. So think about what happens if you assume something and then proceed to act as if you know everything about somebody. Mm -hmm. That would be just as damaging and harmful, right? Right. And so even if I took a trauma-assumed approach and then acted as if all my clients have been through trauma, but I don't dive into it for the individual, mm -hmm. I'm just as bad, right? And sure. so my point is that I wanna be curious. Mm -hmm. I wanna be curious about their experience in the now and about how I am being, how I'm being perceived, but more so how I'm being responded to. So for instance, one of the pieces of the model that I use, um, you know, the safety, the whole safety model, that whole idea of F, Mm -hmm. is for looking at historical functions of behaviors, but also stimuli. So as a caregiver, as an instructor, as a therapist, as an educator, you are a social stimulus. Mm -hmm. Has a social stimulus been paired with aversives in the past? You know, that's the question. And if so, if you don't know that and you assume that you're really reinforcing when you approach somebody or that your praise is going to be reinforcing without any conditioning on your part or anything, you know, as a, as a deliverer of social related stimuli, caregivers are tasked with this. We really should be curious about how am I being responded to? I mean, just look at me, you know, look at my interactions with people, look and see, are they approaching me or are they avoiding me? And what, what changes if I raise my voice or act really big in the room or yell or touch them or approach really quickly, all of those things about what trauma-informed models tell us outside of behavior analysis, right, related to what's safety? Why is that so important to be ins ensured the environment is safe before you go further, really? Mm -hmm. So how do you know you're safe? Well, you know, there's a lot of ways we do it in behavior analysis in terms of assessing um, whether a stimulus is aversive or not aversive. And there's a whole great literature on that, but we don't really pay that much attention to aversive assessments. We do a lot with preferences, right? Yeah. So going back to your point again, Carrie, I think if I assume either way, I'm not helping unless I dive into it on the individual level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes no, sense? I love that. Yeah. Well, part of, you know, some of the people who are objecting are actually people whose work I have valued very deeply, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I don't, I don't want to go down the road of not listening to people because we may differ on one thing. Right. But one of the things I think might be a legitimate, legitimate complaint they have is when we define trauma assumed or trauma informed as completely just writing off, we don't do certain procedures. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Does being trauma-informed mean that you just absolutely cannot use particular procedures? Completely disagree with that. I completely disagree with that. So you're going to be able to go in and look at, look at um, Raja Raman at all in 2022, right? So look at that what is now becoming, I think, rapidly becoming a seminal article for mm -hmm. our field. So they're going to talk a little bit in that, and rightly so, about maybe starting this list about procedures that maybe you shouldn't use if somebody's been through trauma. I will share my own perspective on counterindicated procedures is slightly more no nuanced, and I think theirs probably is too on the individual basis, and they probably agree with this, that what I'm about to say. You don't know until you test. And the reason that I document risks and needs before I jump into treatment is that I want to know some of those historical functions of stimuli so that I know a little bit more about the putative stim uh, reinforcers and punishers that I'm about to use. So 
if something that I would have automatically thought best practice, this is always really a great procedure to use, you know, like starting building rapport and giving little tiny edibles to somebody. What if I knew automatically that that person had been through food insecurity? Mm -hmm. Counterindicated, right, would be trying to pair myself immediately with food, especially if that person goes home at night to an environment where members of their household are still experiencing food insecurity. Now, five years into treatment, as I'm working with them and there's a lot of ascent-based procedures going on continuously, we're working together and they are now telling me, hey, I would really like to work in my session today for X and Y. Am I going to say no? That's on my bookshelf as a list of things that I can't do with you. Not individualized, right? right. And so in every case, I like to use an individualized list that is subject to change subject to change based on data that I'm getting and interactions that we're having. So yes, there are procedures that are more risky to use right away if you know certain things, but I, I do have an article on my website on this. It's maybe back to 2017 now because counterindicated procedures was huge for me when I was beginning my work with trauma. But I have, I've noticed that I use different factors to judge whether something should maybe be nudged off of that list onto the it's less risky now, we're gonna try it with them. And if they would like to continue it and we don't experience a lot of the fallout and they're enjoying this procedure now, should we continue? And so along the lines of um, that wonderful, I think it was Tiger and Heal and Hanley, there was an article a few years ago about assessing person's preference for punishment versus extinction. And it's not what you think, it was individualized, right? Mm. It's individualized. I would add to that, that sometimes the blanketed statements are not only individualized or not only to protect that nuance of the learner, but I think the nuance of the practitioner. So much of our field is super, super young and novice and maybe are working in an organization that doesn't provide as much oversight as needed. And so... Um, I know like, you know, I've made statements before, you know, where it'd be like, oh, just don't, don't do that, you know, to when I was like working at a staff because I was like, because not so much because of the procedure or because of the child, but because that staff member was not yet ready to do that procedure. Right. And so it'd be like, um, you know, like take for extinction, for example, right? Like that would be a procedure that I would say like, Okay, my staff, that would be a, you are not allowed to go there for you procedure. If you have tried all of these things and they haven't worked, then we come to me and then that would be when we're like, okay, now, now we would be adding that in or something like that because it would be, it would be at that nuanced level to make sure that all of those, you know, safety, like, add-ons to make sure that it was safe and it was individualized and it approached with care and concern for that learner because you can go in there and it could be just a wrestling match and expedite all of those harmful, um, you know, nuanced behaviors that you didn't want to see that could emerge from just a really hard and fast, ugly extinction procedure that you that you didn't want to happen, that you're preventing from happening in the first place. And so I think sometimes when you see people talking about Xing things out of the behavior analyst toolbox, I, I wonder sometimes if it's not only kind of like what you were talking about, Camille, but but more maybe just because of uh, the training situation and how our field has just exploded. And, you know, back in our days, it was like the behavior analyst was, was trained and, and raised in a different kind of setting than the kind of the field is now. I wanted to piggyback on that and really thinking about, you know, listening to speak Camille about trauma informed care and how even going to the, the jargon, the language trauma, you know, immediately people think, let's go to the DSM. What is that? What's the definition? What's the definition from the dictionary? And many of us not having that training. Um, but like you're saying, Carrie, way back when we were starting, we were would be individually working with that client and we would be pulling out of our own toolboxes, right? We'd have the training and the experience to say, you know what, this is working, this is not working. 
I'm going to pull back here. I'm going to push a little bit here. Whereas now you've got um, a large group of practicing behavior analysts that are, they have limitations with which they can work within that toolbox. They have limitations within their experience to pull from the toolbox. They might lean on procedures that are written in a specific way. So then um, they come across the language trauma-informed care and it becomes a, I don't even know what that looks like. How do I define it? What exactly does it mean? Um, what does that look like if I'm, you know, doing that at, in an intake? If I, you know, apply this or bring in, you know, a couple tickles, for example, I, I know I've worked with clients where I made the assumption right going in, if I give a tickle and I'm really bubbly, this individual is going to open up and we're going to build a relationship. And it worked with some clients and others immediately pull back and they start to kind of move away. That's when, you know, I can lean on my experience and say, okay, this is not working. Let me find another way in. I've got to, you know, pull in other reinforcers. Um, but some of those newer practitioners who have limitations of training and time, and then all of these um, different languages of trauma-informed care and assent are all coming their way. It's like, how do I wrap this all together and bring this into my practice and go into my organization and start to apply it and learn it in a way that I'm treating individuals respectfully and, you know, with care. Let me wedge in another secret word before you go. Um, <laughs> Secret word number two is aware, A-W-A-R-E. All right, go ahead, Camille. <laughs> well, I just love Nissa's point. I, I love that, Nissa, because you remind me of this realization I think we all have had as supervisors, right? But you don't have this until later, I think. And that just comes because of uh, contingency-shaped behavior. You know, you get there eventually. But the point is your boundaries of competence are so tricky because you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. right? And so one thing that I have been really focusing on and trying to kind of alleviate some of this painful growth that people are having um, and to turn those learning moments into maybe something approach worthy that they'll think, oh, I don't know this. It's not that I need to shrink down and say, oh, one more thing on my list of I can't do that, not qualified. But is that, an, is that an opportunity to expand your boundary of competence? Kind of like Linda LeBlanc in her article a few years ago about expanding the consumer base and your boundaries. I love that one. And the thing that it means for me, and the reason I work on this all the time, um, is that I want practitioners to know that they don't know if their clients have been through trauma. And so they might as well learn to assess different stimuli in their functions to see if things are aversive to their clients. Then if they learn, oh my goodness, my population, because we've done these studies, right? We've, we've looked at, okay, if we do this certain, maybe a, a little pyramid and we, we say, okay, let's just ask how many of our clients and their caregivers have been through a lot of ACEs. So if we just take that book definition, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we learn, wow, 100% of this agency's clientele has been through that. You find yeah. that a lot in developmental disabilities, the group housing situations, um, a lot of the, the nursing homes that I work with, the foster care individuals, that's all going to be very high. And then I have a bunch of early intervention families for whom that's a little bit lower. And that's so great to know because now all my BCBAs and RBTs who are working in that 100% category, I know a few things now that I need to teach them that are not on the task list. Things like a good solid understanding of respondent conditioning and how extinction is going to backfire in a few weeks or days or years and how to predict that and be ready and what I'm going to do differently now. If I didn't know that, I would be very surprised by, you know, my techniques aren't working. What do I do now? And I might go through several problematic techniques that are causing pain to the individual and suffering that is completely unnecessary. So we, if we take that competency approach with, we have a repertoire to grow, mm -hmm. you know, this is our burden to bear. We can differentiate based on what our clients need. And for us supervisors who are doing a lot of that work, we need to grow our boundaries of competence so that we can cover respondent conditioning and schedules and safety signals and maybe those big three or four items that we're not really well covered in our task list anymore. Do you have some suggestions? Uh, you mentioned the ACEs checklist, so I'm going to put that in there. But in terms of other ways, because ACEs checklist requires you to know a lot about the person's history. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we'll have kids in foster care or, you know, heaven forbid, sometimes the, the family that you're working with is the one who is causing the the signs and securities and that sort of thing. So you may not have valid and reliable answers to some of those checklists. Sometimes are there behavioral indicators, checklists, or tools that we can share? Well, and what's the second half of that sentence? To do what? To do I mean, what? it's a legitimate question, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I wouldn't just share a tool and require everybody to start assessing for trauma, quote unquote. That to me would be completely meaningless. Okay. However, if I were to tell all of my supervisees, hey, if you see these five behaviors, I want you to let me know because that might indicate there is a medical need related to trauma that we need to address. Okay. So there are a list of behaviors, by the way. So I'm going to send you all an article to post. It's by Purawall et al., 2016. And this is an article um, written by a group of folks, pediatricians, most of them. And they're all working with former Surgeon General of California. Um, can I throw out a name for everybody to get down? Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. If you haven't already read her stuff or watched her 10 minute TED talk, you know, you're missing out because, well, and for those of you who are strict behavior analysts, she was going to be our BF Skinner speaker until COVID hit and she got called away to COVID duties in oh, California. No. <laughs> so her 2018 book is really good, but if you want a pediatrician's perspective on what are the behavioral red flags that they look for when they're going to start coordination efforts to try to solve some medical issues before they get out of hand. There are certain behavioral indicators. And so I do have lists of those. You can look up their little list. Um, I also, Shannon, I look for situations that tell me, based on my work with social workers, mm -hmm. that something is going to be flagged in terms of trauma. So for instance, somebody's been through multiple placements already and they're coming to my work. Even if I'm treating them for autism related issues and they're learning to talk, Okay, but yeah. if they've also been through lots of foster homes, there are issues we need to resolve and be supportive on. So I don't know, Shannon, if there are a lot of checklists that I would recommend. It's not that. It's not that I want people to start implementing new tools right away, right? I think that might just be another burden that training would be required for. But in terms of an approach for people to realize that, yes, there are behaviors that cluster together that a medical professional would see and flag, or to know that there are certain situations that tell us with almost 90 or 100 percent certainty, it is traumatizing to go through multiple caregivers before age six or seven, right? Things like that will tell you there was disruption in early relationships and those kinds of things do give rise to really aversive situations for folks growing up. Absolutely. I, I think I'm, I mentioned to you when we talked earlier, I fell in love with the work of Dr. Nadine Burke Harris because I, I heard, you no, know, everyone likes to hear people say things that they also say. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I've been saying for years, I don't want to see another report that has four psychotropic medications and five diagnoses in a, four, in a 12 year old. I know what that means. I know what that means. And it's not any words that are on that paper, but it is certainly a flag that something has gone terribly wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So you wanted to really make sure that we talked about the safety signal and, and working on the buffers and preventive behavior analysis. I wanted to give some time at the end of this to make sure that we got to that. Mm. You know, it does tie back to the very same uh, person you just mentioned. And I, I am on a roll about prevention right now. Awesome. Okay. So it's Great. something I'm working hard on in terms of policy. And I encourage mm -hmm. everybody to jump on this if they can. Um, if you only knew the percentage of GDP, you know, even to take a measure like that, that's huge, gross domestic product that, that we spend on trauma every year or on treating the medical impacts of trauma, if you only knew it, I mean, it is huge. So um, 
two to six percent of our GDP could be. I mean, it's it's huge, depending on the country and which European nation or North American nation you're looking at. So prevention is so important. A lot of people aren't willing to adopt the strategies that we know about that are preventive. There are lots of reasons for that. And so, for example, there are some buffers that Dr. Nadine Barkaris and others have described. And that article I researched, or I'm sorry, that article that I referenced a second ago, the Pura Wall et al. 2016, is going to go over these six. Some people look at these six and say, this is so silly and simple. I'm not going to sort of, you know, dine to address that because someone else should. So mm -hmm. there are things like getting good nutrition, having a safe relationship with an adult, um, getting adequate sleep, good sleep hygiene, mindfulness, okay? Exercise is a huge one. Nature, spending time in nature is turning out to be one as well. Um, and there's, there's one more related to getting good mental health care. So these six things, if kids do those things, if you start installing them in the child's behavioral repertoire, and then my point is I would like to add that for the caregivers too, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you install those, that person is much less likely to encounter the same medical impacts mm -hmm. of the same trauma they've experienced. Mm -hmm. And if they go through new trauma, they are now buffered against the medical impacts. And they're, the medical impacts have been described for uh, several generations now. You know, you could go back to Joe Brady's work with stress, or you could look at work from outside our field, like the, the Doobie, uh, and the Felidi and Anda studies, and all of that work on stress and toxic stress and its medical impact. The point being, there are things that protect against that medical impact. They really do work. I ask you, what behavior analyst wouldn't be good at designing a program to help a parent make sure their child gets better sleep, good, good nutrition, et cetera? And if not, don't you want to have somebody on your staff whose job it is to know who in the community to connect that family to? And don't you want to do that first before you go treating a behavior that was related to that the whole time? Mm -hmm. So these things are powerful. They seem so simple that they're overlooked. I would argue that in our ethics code, where we are tasked to look at environmental conditions that might be hampering our program success, right? I would say there it is. Yeah. You know, these I are preventative strategies. They are doable. I 100% agree, and I think that's the most overlooked component of behavior analysis with the the behavior analysis that's going on, like in clinic settings and such, is people not understanding that that is a part of the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so well, glad. I've had to. I've had to. I needed that from a friend of mine, and then I then passed on that knowledge to another friend of mine where I was working with a family that we had to work on like just even mealtime, not, not like getting a child to eat, but saying like, Hey, you, you need to have dinner. Like you, you as a family, like you guys aren't eating. Yeah. Um, so you, you all need to actually eat. Uh, like they like just food security. Like they they had they had food stamps and stuff like that. But like just scheduling to to make sure that they were consuming food. Um, to make sure that they were contacting their social worker, making sure that they were um, you know, feeding their child uh when she wasn't going to school, like things like this, and um. And so like my, my job, my, my parenting, like my parent training shifted from typical parent training to like, okay, like my, my priorities are shifted. So when my, my friend, uh, who's a great behavior analyst, she was talking to me, I'm like, oh no, I, I now know the case that you have. And this is like, you got to address all of these issues before you even get to, uh, you know, getting the parents on track to do man training and toilet training and things like that. You got to address these basic needs first. Yeah. Um, and it is, it is totally, I think within a wheelhouse, bring in outside sources, but like these are at the top 
uh, and needs to be addressed. Yeah. And I just, else. I want to apologize on the front end to clinic people. If you, if, if, that's, if that's kind of rude and isolating that, it's just that I do know that uh, like talking to people who do in-home services, mm -hmm. I think that becomes much more clear and much more salient. And especially if you're doing as part like of an early intervention team where you have other people that you're collaborating with to work through yeah. those things. Well, we, so. you know, we provide services in the home, but, or in, in the clinic, but I always like to do the parent training in the home for that purpose to be right. like, okay, we're going to, we're going to do like, this is where we see how are things going? What is your day? Like, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you schedule things? What is, is going to even work in your routine? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Doesn't have to be every session, but you gotta, you gotta have your eyes on, on what's going on. Absolutely. This also is an impact of access to services for some, you know, different types of families. I've worked in, different funding sources from the, the large commercial payers to um, Medicaid and other types of funding sources where some of the, the funding source families that I served, it was this very much ecological assessment of like, are the doors locked? Do you know, if she's in a diaper at, you know, as a teenager, who is changing the diaper? Yeah. Um, you know, is mom even home for session? If it's older brother, is older brother the one changing the diaper? There are some really true um, basic living conditions that you're you're working with and you know i had a family in particular that i worked with where those were the concerns and i went in as a new behavior analyst with my treatment plan and my goals and i'd gone and observed in the school and the mom came in and was like i can't i can't read so thank you for bringing this treatment plan but you're going to have to explain it to me because i cannot read any of this 20 page document um so there is a uh, an access to service situation. So I think Shannon, your point about cl clinical services, a lot of those families can't get to a clinic. Yeah, yeah. you know, transportation, ability to make copays. That's a that's another concern that we have for those families. Yes, yeah. it goes. Don't go along with the clinic schedule. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, work schedules. Do they have transportation to get mm -hmm. anywhere related to the buffers? You know, it also brings to mind all of the cultural implications of what we do and really knowing mm -hmm. your client. And if not, investing the time and mm -hmm. relationships with others that can help you maximize where their strengths are. You know, nobody owns the buffers. OK, so I'm not going to tell any of my family. So they have to do those six things a certain way. But you would be so shocked by the percentage of families that might not have ever heard Oh, it is really important to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And that I care about you so much that I really want to make sure we're helping you with that. So I'm going to check in with you every six months or so. Whenever we review your plan, you know, how are you doing with these? Do you want any help with X and Y? Mm -hmm. So I just want to end that piece, Shannon, because I, I think buffers are so important. But I want to end this piece with a nod to the barriers, mm -hmm. because without a focus, on here's what the barriers are, whether they're access, information, resources, behavioral needs that are getting in the way, you know, skills that need to be more fluent, cultural differences that make this one devalued or this one really, you know, not addressed at all. Um, whatever those barriers are, we can problem solve them together. And so we, we have to have a focus on what could I do that would be preventive because I'll tell you a secret, and I've said this, I think, on a podcast before, and it is true. Not all of my clients got behavior analysis after I was done with them. Sometimes I just looked at the risks and the needs, and we solved something different. And I handed it off, and I was really excited because of the progress they'd made. Yeah. And so what, what would be more horrible you know, than treating something behaviorally when somebody else was starving in the family? Yeah or something terrible was going on at night after sessions that I could have prevented. So if we shift prevention, which is not without precedent either in our literature, right? Um, the behavioral-based safety stuff that's really old, like the 70s work on seatbelt use and all of Miltenberger's work with guns and mm -hmm. you know the work more recently, um, Shala Alai Rosales and her beautiful study about the big four preventative behavior analysis, you know, do we teach kids in advance to be able to use a safe behavior to get their needs met? Or do we wait on them to need, you know, to use one of those challenging behaviors to work on the four functions? Preventative behavior analysis, I think, is more important than being trauma-informed or trauma-insumed or even trauma-sensitive. 
Okay, there's a new one. We got trauma informed, trauma assumed, trauma aware, and trauma sensitive now. <laughs> Preventive, go there. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> the last secret word is just assumed. A S S U M E D. <laughs> so the last secret word is assumed. And I, you know, I, I want to say this could go on for another hour. We could definitely bring you back just to talk about in a more um, extended way this last piece. Um, but I know that you have other things to do in life besides hang here with us. So I'm going to wind things down by just asking, um, are you going to be speaking anywhere, publishing anything? How can people find your work? Oh, sure. Lots of that going on. I can't tell you yet where it will be published, but I am really passionate about the policy piece. And so I have some stuff in the works for that. Um, Gabby Morgan, Dr. Gabby Morgan is having a conference on trauma and we might want to go back later and give your viewers information on that. Um, yeah. Because if they don't catch it this go round, which is the end of this month, we're recording this in, um, okay. they want to go next year. So there's, it's Baypath. Baypath is doing an all trauma mm -hmm. conference. Dr. Golden is going to be there. Um, so one of your pals, Shannon, who you gave a shout out to, I think Dr. Tarbox is going to be there as well. Mm -hmm. Some other, some other folks. Yep. I'm going to be speaking there about another passionate area about talking about looking, um, at somebody's repertoire in terms of their, um, the response classes they're using and how that can give you a clue as to how you need to alter your behavior as an analyst with respect to what they find aversive. So um, that's coming up. Of course, ABAI for me is coming up and we have some neat stuff going on there. Um, but I, I'm always findable at cuspemergence.com. It's where I blog, although not frequently, given that I have two kids under four. Um, and Cusp Emergence University, which is where the trainings are. Fantastic. Um, Carrie Nissa, do you have any updates? This will be coming out sometime in the summer, June or July. Uh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say uh, I plan on going to Weba, so I'm not sure it will be around that time. Um, yeah. And we'll have CR Unite in the fall. Yeah. So. Nissa, how about you? Any news? I'm in the same uh, as Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> right, I, guess, I, know, right? <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing this weekend. <laughs> it's a day by day. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's important to live in the moment too. Uh, being mindful is so helpful for clients and caregivers. So got a shout out to your knowing what's going on today. That's, that's enough sometimes. <laughs> For sure. Yes, Shannon, please. I do have a code word for y'all. Um, I will just make it TBV. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. And so I can I can make sure there's a deep discount in there if anybody wants to learn anything more about what I've been talking about. If don't pay full price for a training. If you hear the podcast, go to your checkout and put in TBV as your coupon. Okay? Oh, you're so generous. Oh, you are so awesome. nice. Thank you so much. Of so course, I love this podcast, and it's been so fun to meet y'all. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So go to Cusp Emergence and grab your discount. Um, I'll piggyback on that and say uh, those of you who are doing anything or wanting to do anything with the Hanley discount that we have, time's running out because it's summer now. So go and grab that one. Um, I think that would be a nice twofer for everybody. Just get all your CEUs at once. Discounts <laughs> from our friends. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being with us. This yes. has been Oh my goodness. Thank you all for valuing the topic. You know, I oh. say that to people who write me for more information and I mean it with all of my heart. I think to value something means to look at it closely and let it affect you and use some committed actions related to what we've been talking about, you know. Um, I, I really love the topic, but I, I love talking about it and getting other people interested in how to be preventive and, and supportive. We can do this. I think, I think discussions like this and research that you're doing is, is actually taking our field forward and not having us get stuck in the rut. You know, Skinner wanted us to dive into this work and he just didn't know 
how to do it. And he talked about, we wanted to talk about feelings and thoughts and stuff like that. And he mentioned that he's like, yes, we should go there. I just, one day I, we will be able to. Yeah. And he said, one day we'll be able to, I just don't know how to do it right now. And so I think that, that, you know, we have, we're getting the technology to do that and we're getting the boldness to go there. And they think that, um, you know, we're, we're taking the steps to do so. And, you know, some people, they don't want to go on that journey, then that's their choice to do so. And I'm just, I am hopeful and I am excited. And I feel like that this is now um, going to make an impact to the rest of healthcare and education, as opposed to being kind of like this little viewed as archaic from the rest of the world. I never viewed it as archaic, but I know that the rest of the community does. And I think that we're now getting to be players of uh, dealing with policy and healthcare and education. Um, so that's, I think it's really incredible when we're being able to deal with meaty substance like this. So it's, it's exciting. And I think that Carrie labeled you as the OG of <laughs> t t TIBA. So we want to say thank you for uh, trail being such a trailblazer here. Yes. It's always been easy. You know, and not because you're old Gosh. by any means. Your children are younger than mine. <laughs> Your children are like, I, I'm the one with the gray hair. But it means that you broke, you're busting down the walls. And like as a woman who breaks down yeah. the walls with that, you have skin in the game and it's hard and you're like, it's not easy. And there's a lot of work that had to be done and just acknowledging the being that trailblazer and all that you've gone through and all the pushback that I'm sure that you must have experienced in doing so. So just know that like, I, I, we recognize that. And, um, and the head oh my gosh, Mary, so. you're making me blush. It would be no. a good time for my computer to break again and turn me pink. I'm sure it's happening all over my face here. But I, I really appreciate that so much. You know, as a parent of a four-year-old, I have never been more aware of wanting to make sure that people can be authentic, mm -hmm. really. You know, I don't want her to just be a nice girl. I want her to do what she wants to do. And I am really fortunate. I had a biology mom and, you know, a dad who just was an artist and all kinds of things and let me try whatever I wanted to do. And they were very supportive. Not everybody has that. But those of us that, that have some kind of privilege like that, you go ahead and act on it and try to change the world. There's, there's really no reason you shouldn't. And there's a lot of naysaying. I'm totally fine with that. I'm totally fine with I that. Love it. <laughs> then you are definitely the person to like plow that path. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so That's much, awesome. Carrie. Thank you all for having me on. So appreciate it. Thank you. And that is a great way to wa to uh, wrap things up. So we will say goodbye for now. And we hope to see you next time on the Pave Your Key. Would love that. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.